All right, so today I'm presenting on uh, work we did uh, for NeurIPS uh, 2018 called Video Capsule Net, a Simplified Network for Action Detection. Uh, I'll start with a basic overview of capsule networks and then go into the, the work uh, in more finer detail. So for capsule networks, the idea is uh, that conventional convolutional neural networks don't really explicitly model entities within an image or video. Um, so what capsule networks do, they add extra structure to CNNs to model these entities. Um, so this is done in two parts. So first, capsule networks group neurons together. So as opposed to having single activations in regular CNNs, we have groups of neurons describing different entities or features. And then these uh, groups are then routed by agreement to model part to whole relationships. Um, so. So this takes inspiration from inverse graphics. So, um, so in computer graphics, uh, we start off with a set of instantiation parameters. Let me get the laser pointer. So we start off with a set of instantiation parameters. Then we call a rendering function to get an image. Inverse graphics does the inverse of this, which we start off with an image. We call an inverse rendering function to get the instantiation parameters. So the idea behind a capsule network is this inverse rendering function will be the capsule network, and these instantiation parameters will be the capsules themselves, right? So the capsules will have the information about the position and the angle of the different entities in the image, um, or the pose information, right? So more specifically, a uh, capsule is defined in, we use a capsule in our work, uh, which is a, a four by four pose matrix and an activation neuron. So a total of 17 activations per capsule. The pose matrix has these instantiation parameters, and the activation is between 0 and 1, and that defines whether or not the entity is in the image, or video in our case. Um, capsules at lower levels, so we have a set of capsule layers, right? So lo the first capsule layer will vote for the next, and so on. So capsules at lower levels vote for capsules in higher levels. Um, so these votes are given by this transformation, so M is the pose matrix, WIJ is the set of learned weight matrices, and there's a matrix multiplication to get a vote. And what these votes are is a, a set of predictions from part to whole. So the lower level capsules, M, or a subscript I, would vote on what they believe a capsule in the next level uh, would uh, look like. So that would be their votes. Um, and then these votes are grouped together by routing by agreement. So basically, I won't go over the routing by agreement. They, we use an EM routing algorithm. Um, but basically, that just tries to find similarities within the votes. And if they're more similar, then the activation is uh, closer to 1. If they're less similar, then the activation is closer to 0, so for the next layer. right? Um, so prior to this work, uh, capsule networks were shown to have good results on MNIST and small NORB. Uh, so they're small image data sets for classification. But uh, they have not really been successfully applied to higher dimensional data, so larger images, and in our case, video. Uh, and the reason is that capsule networks are computationally costly. And it's very difficult to fit, fit deep networks into memory. Um, I'll go into why right now. So uh, in order to do that, I'll basically go over conventional convolutional layers and then capsule convolutional layers. So with conventional convolutions, you should uh, know this, but I'll go briefly over this. We start off with an input layer with some height, width, and since it's uh, video, some time dimension, and also a, a number of channels, right, CL. We have a receptive field which we want to perform our convolution on. And we have a set of kernels, right? And these are learned uh, parameters. And what we do is uh, we multiply these kernels by their receptive field element-wise. And then we get a summation to get a set of scalar activations. And these scalar activations are what we put in the following output layer, right? So in this case, we would have a new height and width and time dimension and also a new set of output channels, right? So for convolutional capsule layers, it's similar. Right? We have an input layer, but in this case, uh, we have a, set, a number of capsule types. 
and each one of these capsules is the 16, uh, right, the 4 by 4 pose matrix and the activation. Then we have a receptive field. And instead of kernels, we have a transformation matrices. So each one of these is a 4 by 4 matrix. Uh, and then we have this many 4 by 4 transformation matrices. Um, then what we do is we do matrix multiplication between these capsules and the transformation matrix to get a set of votes. Then the votes are put through an EM routing algorithm to calculate capsule outputs. Um, and there's CL plus one capsule outputs. And then these are put in the output layer, right? And we have to slide basically, like in regular convolution, we slide the receptive field along the input layer to get the output layer capsules, right? So as you can see here with the votes, there are this many number of votes. So that's CL times CL plus one. So the number of capsule types in both layers. And that is multiplied by the receptive field size. So each one of these, since each one of these votes is 16 dimensional, right? This as the uh, number of capsule types in each layer increases or the number of, or the dimension of the uh, receptive field increases, then the amount of values you have to set, store in memory is, becomes exceedingly large. So uh, putting deep networks really is difficult to fit into memory. So we, in order to circumvent this, we have two simplifications. So the first is we use the same transformation matrix for capsules of the same type and capsule pooling. Um, so, so we go back to this figure, all right? And so the first simplification is we use the same transformation transformation matrix for capsules of the same type. So capsule, let's say this is type 1, would be using uh, the same, so all capsules within the receptive field of the same type would be multiplied by the same transformation matrix to calculate these votes. Right, so that reduces the number of transformation matrices. However, this does not reduce the number of total votes calculated, and the, uh, so we have to do capsule pooling to do that. Um, so in capsule pooling, we get the receptive field, and then we average the capsules within that receptive field to uh, get a single capsule per capsule type. Then, oh, uh, then we multiply by the transformation matrix matrices to get this set of votes. Now uh, this, we reduce the set of votes, and we don't have a vote per capsule in the receptive field, just one per capsule type. So uh, that drastically reduces the number of votes and allows the EM routing algorithm to be computed much faster. Uh, and we could fit multiple layers into memory, even for video data, which is high dimensional. Um, so with this, I'll go into the action detection uh, portion, so um, what our network does. Um, so. Uh, this is a brief overview of current action detection networks. So, mul uh, so usually action detection methods require multiple uh, processes, so uh, complex pipelines. So start with a region proposal network, right, which gets different proposals for what actors could be. And then they classify each of these regions, perform bounding box regressions. Um, they often require optical flow. and uh, the networks are rarely trained end to end. So this region proposal network is um, first trained, and then the optical flow network is trained separately, and then they're all put together, and that's trained again. So, so it usually, uh, so we designed like a more elegant solution to this problem. So for the video capsule architecture, we begin with an input video. So eight frames, and there are 112 by 112 pixels uh, height and width. And what we want is we want uh, localization on all those eight frames. So uh, given an actor, we want to localize within each of those eight frames what, where the actor is. And we also want a, a classification um, of what the actor is doing. So, it, so this is the overall network. And I'll go into the different parts of the network. Um, so the encoder uh, is as follows. We have the input video. We pass this input video through a series of 3D convolutions, right? So that's just regular 2D convolutions, just with temporal dimension as well. And that gives us a set of feature maps. 
right? Uh, the dimension of these feature maps is still eight frames, but it's 28 by 28 because we have strided convolutions. Then we use a convolutional operation uh, with a receptive field of three by nine by nine to get the capsules, right? The primary capsule layer, ConvCaps1. So, so these are the capsules, right, with a four by four pose matrix and the activation. And the dimensions are 20 by 20 by six. And there's 32 different capsule types. So 32 different entities are being modeled here. Um, then we follow this with a, a convolutional a capsule, convolutional layer, ConvCaps2, which uses a, a capsule pooling. Uh, and then, so we have 32 higher level capsules and the dimensions are as follow, uh, eight by eight by four. Then this is followed by a fully connected capsule layer, which gives us a set of class capsules. So this class capsule is basically just one for each class in the data set. When in UCF 101, there's 24 classes. So there'd be 24 class capsules. And each one of these models the different actions, um, whether it be golfing or, or uh, diving or basketball, right? Um, so, so yeah, uh, we'll go into more detail in here, but basically we use um, coordinate addition so that we don't lose this positional information in this final fully connected layer. Then the decoder network, uh, we get the class capsule and we mask out uh, the class of interest. So in, at training time, uh, the class of interest is the ground truth class. So in this case, it'd be golfing. So right, the, the golfing capsule would be, or uh, every other thing other than the golfing capsule would mask out. And we pass this through a fully connected layer to get uh, 256 uh, features. And then we reshape that and have a series of convolutional transposes to get the output localization. Um, we also have skip connections from the previous capsule layer, the convolutional capsule layers, to ensure the spatial temporal information is maintained, right? Um, and then we get our final localization. Um, I'll go into now the chord in addition. So earlier I mentioned going from the final convolutional capsule layer to the, f to the class capsule layer, we don't want to lose that uh, eight by eight by four positional information. So what we do is we do chord in addition. So first we have, let's say we have a capsule, so I'll give you an example. So we have a capsule at position time one and height width of four and two. So this capsule creates a vote, and then in that vote we add in the we add in the coordinate in the last three uh, positions. So coordinate addition. So this last this uh, position would correspond with a time. So we add in time is equal to one here because it's at uh, time is equal to one position the same with the height, and then the same with the width. So this would be the vote matrix with coordinate addition that is passed into the EM routing algorithm. Um, capsule masking, as I said earlier, uh, training all classes except the ground truth class are masked out. That's so it learns the class specific information used for localization. Um, and then at test time, since we don't have the ground truth, we use the predicted class, so the class with the highest activation and that is everything other than that class is masked out. Um, the network is trained end to end with two losses. So the first is a classification loss. So what this classification loss is, is a, a margin loss. So basically AT is the target class activation. So the, ground tr the activation of the ground truth class uh, capsule and AI is the activation of all other capsules, all other, other class capsules. And what this does is it tries to push uh, the ground truth activation to be higher than the other activations by this margin M. And it's, it's steadily increased from 0.2 to 0.9 over time, over training. Um, and then the segmentation loss. This is the standard uh, binary cross entropy loss for, for segmentation. And the total loss is a, a weighted sum between these two. We, we have this lambda here so that this uh, segmentation loss does not dominate over this uh, classification loss. So the results are as followed for localization accuracy. So uh, for UCS sports, uh, the network achieves state-of-the-art results in VMAP, so an increase of 1% in VMAP. Uh, JHNDB 
we have a much larger increase of about 15% uh, in VMAP. And then UCF Sports, or UCF 101, which is the largest of the data sets, uh, we see improvements across the board. So 2% in FMAP and about a 20% increase in all VMAP uh, IOUs. Um, so here are some qualitative results. So the red, is the, the red bo box is the ground truth uh, bounding box, and then the blue is the output of our network. Uh, so, yeah. So even if the object or the actor moves off screen and comes back, we still maintain uh, segmenting it. And even if there's quite a bit of motion, like in these two last two, uh, the network is still able to successfully segment the actions. Yeah. Uh, so, so now I'll go into the ablations. So we want to test the different parts of our network. Um, so first is capsule masking. Uh, we want to test if capsule masking is uh, giving us better localization results. Uh, so, so this is, let's see, predicted class. Uh, right. So if we mask out the predicted class at test time, we get the following uh, scores. But if we mask out the ground truth classes, so let's say we know the class we want to segment and we mask out everything but those classes, then we get higher localization results. That means the, caps, the class capsules do hold information that is important per class for segmentation. Um, then we test coordinate addition. Um, so for coordinate addition, uh, we show that it, maintaining that information, the coordinate information, is uh, important to the score. So without coordinate addition, we see uh, uh, worse results across the board for accuracy, for classification accuracy and uh, localization accuracy. And then uh, we, uh, we test if extra skip connections are needed. So currently we only have skip connections from the capsule layers. We want to see if skip connections from the convolutional layers, which are, have higher dimensionality, right, in uh, height and width, if those would help. Um, but it turns out that even without skip connections from those layers, we still got comparable results. So there's no real need to have those skip connections because uh, the network would just be slower without any real benefit. Um, uh, another is the number of convolutional layers. So the network has six convolutional layers before the capsule layers. So we tested four convolutional, six, and then eight. And we just found that six seems to do best. Um, and then we have ablations on the losses. So we tested, so this first uh, column here is the network just for classification. And the second one is the network just for segmentation. So we just train it with those losses. And then this final network, the final column is the both losses combined. Um, we show that by combining both losses, the network is able to learn better than just uh, having each one separately. So the classification. Uh, information is helping the segmentation accuracy, and then the segmentation is helping the classification accuracy. Um, we also test if reconstruction is important. So in the original CastleNet paper, they use reconstruction as a, a regularization term uh, for their classification experiments. We find that reconstructing uh, the original video does help with classification. However, uh, the segmentation, uh, yeah, so using segmentation is a better regularizer than using reconstruction. So, um, yeah, segmentation is a, a ba better training signal than just reconstruction. And then using all three seem to do worse than just using segmentation and classification. Um, yeah. So last thing we have is a set of synthetic data set experiments. So we want to learn what these capsules are actually modeling. Um, so in order to do this, we can't really do this with real world data because it's difficult to change those slightly and see the results. So we, we, set, we create a synthetic data set of primitive shapes moving in noisy backgrounds. Um, there's four different motion types. So these will be the four different classes the network has to classify. So linear motion, circular motion, a turn. So it's like a just linear motion and then a, a to change an angle and another linear motion, and a random motion. And 
the primitive shapes can vary in these different uh, properties. So shape, color, speed, direction, size. Um, and so, so here are some examples. So here's a, just a, a rectangle moving and a circle moving linearly in both cases, I believe. Um, and we find that, so, so what we do is we train the network on the synthetic data set, um, on this synthetic data set, and we examine the linear motion ca class capsule. And we find that uh, changes in the different properties of the object actually has predictable out out outcomes uh, to the capsule dimensions. So here we have the 16 dimensions of the capsule, right, the 4 by 4 pose matrix. Right, see, this, these are 16 dimensions, and we vary the angle of motion. So 0 would be horizontal left to right, uh, pi would be right to left, and then this is just you know every angle in between. Um, and we see that as the angle changes, we see a predictable change in all, pretty much all the capsule dimensions. So that shows that the capsules are modeling this, the direction information uh, of the object. And we see this across the board with basically all properties. So the speed, the rotation, whether or not it's zooming out, the size, we can see that if any one of these is changed, there's also a, a predictable change in these capsule dimensions. Notably, uh, if we look at the last three dimensions, which correspond to the coordinate addition, uh, it does exactly what we would suppose it to do. So in this one, which, re which represents the height, uh, it is maximized when there is a vertical motion, right? Um, whereas uh, the one with the width, uh, when the one that corresponds with the width of the uh, of the video, then it, it's minimized when there's vertical motion, right? And maximized when there's horizontal motion. So we can see that the 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 coordinate addition does help with the uh, modeling of the the motion. Yeah, and that's about it.